I am delighted to be with you and coming forth out after three uh, amazing presentations, uh, I've been trying to wrap my brains on, on, on what best to kind of cover. And I think one of the things I want to do is to pick up the three points that Molly made at the very end of her presentation. She had a slide you might remember at the end that said, what makes a Green New Deal green? And she had three points that she made there about social justice, about inclusion, and about growth. And I thought I might just structure a few comments around, uh, around those ideas. But I wanted to start as well by emphasizing something else that, that Molly said, which was about kind of beware of, of, of false substitutes, I suppose. I think this sense now that the Green New Deal can mean anything to anyone because it's a bit of a catchphrase and it'll just get picked up. And if we're not very careful, it will lose some of the radical edge that it needs to have. And I, I just fear a little bit that just as we've seen the government completely empty the term sustainability of any kind of meaningful uh, you know, graft anymore, the same thing could happen to this. It's already happening right now, frankly, to the idea of, of a climate emergency. Um, I've just been in a debate uh, on the Queen's speech, um, and today's debate actually had the heading climate emergency, and it's the first time since I've been in Parliament since 2010 when you've had four or five days of debates on the Queen's speech that they've actually sort of thought about having a day ostensibly dedicated to climate and environment issues. I have to say in parenthesis, if you actually look at the Queen's speech, there are only six words on climate change, but <laughs> that apart, they have now kind of woken up to the fact that climate emergency is something they need to start talking about. And yet, the gulf between what they mean by a climate emergency and what we mean by it, I think you can see just by the very fact that they are talking about a net zero target date of 2050. In other words, 30 years ahead. And as I said in the speech today, you know, it's just like picking up the telephone to call the emergency services because there's a fire and saying, you know, could I have a fire engine, please, in 30 years' time? I mean, this just doesn't work. The fire is now. Our house is on fire now, as Greta Thunberg so eloquently says. And so we need that urgent action now. And similarly, when it comes to the Green New Deal, this isn't just about an investment in infrastructure, important though that is. The social justice side of this whole idea is massively important. And so when the small group of us were getting together in Anne Pettifer's flat, Anne Pettifer, I must pay tribute to, um, she was one of the founders of the Jubilee Debt Campaign. She's a, a, a prolific writer on, on, on economics, and she's just brought out a book called The Case for a Green, Deal that, a Green New Deal that was um, uh, published earlier this week. But when we were gathering in her flat, you know, the, the, the key issues we were concerned about then in terms of the gathering financial crisis, in terms of the accelerating climate crisis, in terms of the, the nature crisis, all of those things in the last 10 or 11 years have clearly only got more serious uh, and, and more concerning. And so I, I think the urgency with which we already felt the Green New Deal had 10 or 11 years ago has now only been underlined still further by what's happened in those years of austerity where the poorest parts of our communities have been hollowed out the most, where the poorest people have paid the highest price of a financial crisis that was none of their making. And at the same time, as Molly and the others have alluded to, the climate crisis is gathering in seriousness as well. The IPCC report in October saying completely unequivocally, we have just 10 or 11 years to get off this collision course that we're on with climate catastrophe. So, so the need for this idea of a Green New Deal is greater than ever but the importance of, of being clear about what those components are for a Green New Deal, I think, are more important than ever. And for me, the focus of the Green New Deal on an economic system that has failed to work for the environment or, crucially, for people is, is vital. And that recognition that it's those same economic forces that are despoiling our environment, that are driving our climate emissions, are the same economic forces that are also leaving so many people out of growing prosperity among some in our, in our communities, but, but far less, uh, and, and indeed growing inequality um, in others. So I think that the Green New Deal is, is like a once in a, in a generation opportunity to fix that economic system that is damaging both environment and, and the lives of so many people right across <coughs> our country. So that is why it is so important that in that first point that, Polly, uh, that uh, Molly made about social justice, that is why it is so important to make sure that the investment from the Green New Deal, in my view at least, should go first and foremost into those communities that have suffered the most <clears throat> from the current economic system that has treated them so badly. 
You know, in, in government speak, these, these communities are often called the left behind communities. I don't like that term. Left behind makes it sound like you've just left your specs down the back of the sofa. This is not being left behind by accident. It is the direct and inevitable result of an economic system that is based on haves and have nots and is driving inequality. And therefore, these people have been systematically excluded from an economic system uh, which is not working for them. So let's make sure that a Green New Deal, first of all, is genuinely uh, socially just and genuinely invests in those communities that need it most. And it also needs to be globally just as well. And again, this frustrates me when I look at the government again this afternoon in the debate we've just had on, on the climate emergency. You know, the government kept sort of slapping its own back and ministers looking very pleased with themselves for saying that, you know, the UK is the global leader on climate change and we've got our emissions down by 42% over the last uh, few decades. And that completely overlooks a number of issues. First of all, the UK was disproportionately responsible for the climate emissions in our atmosphere, given that we were just about the first country to industrialise, and therefore, as the first country into the Industrial Revolution, we need to be the first country out of it. We need to recognise that in that process of industrialisation, we basically colonised the ability of other countries to emit their fair share, because we've kind of already exploited that. And therefore, I think we need to, first of all, make the case that the UK has a historical responsibility to go further than most other countries. Uh, but also, and, and this was a, a, a point made by, by one of the Tory MPs in, in the room, he was saying, well, you know, China emits so much more than the UK and, and therefore we don't really need to worry. Well, let's all just worry about China. And obviously there's a slight difference when it comes to population numbers, but that apart, so many of the emissions in China are precisely linked to products which we are importing into this country. So if we choose to outsource a whole load of our manufacturing, not surprisingly, our climate emissions go down because we've basically outsourced them to China. Well, it doesn't seem very fair to me that they then have to put the full cost of those emissions on their accounts and we just kind of sit back and, and say, well, you know, we're, we're, we're clean and green. So a Green New Deal has to be globally just as well, which is why it needs to have very tough targets. On inclusion, and I wanted to say a little bit of, about this because that was the second of the, of the, of the three points that, that Molly was making at the end there about what inclusion um, really looks like. And I wanted to give an example really because it seems to me that part of that inclusion obviously has to be with workers who are currently in sectors deemed to be high carbon, or indeed they are high carbon sectors, and we need to think about how we bring those people with us during this transition, this so-called just transition to a genuinely zero carbon future. And although it's very easy for people like, like myself to stand here and say, well, there are far more jobs in a green economy than there are in the fossil fuel economy that it replaces, although that's a very easy thing to say and it's very true, if you happen to have your job right now in a high carbon sector, it is of very little reassurance just to know that theoretically, academically, there are more jobs in a different kind of economy that we don't yet have. And it seems to me that when we're trying to identify allies that we're going to need in terms of how we make this Green New Deal happen, then the unions are absolutely our first and foremost allies in this. And so having that dialogue with, with, with unions, listening to their concerns, and genuinely trying to set out in a granular fashion what a Green New Deal would look like is hugely important. And so, you know, I would love to make sure that a Green New Deal would work in places like Scunthorpe, and I don't know what the, what the equivalent communities might be in, in, in the West of England, but in those communities, that kind of currently feel as if they are having a very bad time when it comes to you know, the future of, of some of the industry in our country. So if, it, if, if, if a Green New Deal doesn't work in, in Scunthorpe, where they've, where, they, where they've got steel, and we need to be looking at how you make steel in a much more environmentally friendly way, and we need steel in the future for our wind turbine, turbines and everything else, those workers need to be at the forefront of that whole process. A Green New Deal can't be done to people, it has to be done with them, and that means listening. And I wanted to just give one, example, and I apologise that it's from quite a long time ago, uh, and also for the fact that it bears my name, although it's got nothing to do with me, sadly. I'd like to claim this was my great uncle or something, but anyway, I want to just quickly remind you about the Lucas Plan, um, which was drawn up by workers at Lucas Aerospace in the early 1970s. Uh, basically, in 1974, workers at Lucas Aerospace faced serious job losses because of defence cuts that had been promised by the new incoming Labour government. And they went to speak to the then Secretary of State for Industry, Tony Benn, who told them that he couldn't bail them out or nationalise the company. 
you should have talked to Jeremy Corbyn, but anyway, or to us. But anyway, but what they should do is to think about what they could be making instead of making weapons. So at first, they asked the experts, 180 of them, but they got very little response, just three in fact. So then they asked the workers themselves what they could make using the skills that they have that would be more socially and environmentally useful than weapons. And they were absolutely deluged with ideas. And they whittled the suggestion down to 150 ideas for products, each one socially useful and environmentally friendly. And they included, and remember this is 1974, wind turbines, solar cells, energy efficient heat pumps, hybrid power packs for cars, commonplace now, but virtually unheard of in the 1970s. So the workers from the Lucas Aerospace took those ideas around the world. They went to Sweden, to Germany, the USA. They were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in, in 1979. I would love to end the story by saying, and the factory was converted and it all ended happily, and sadly it didn't. But, but I think the Lucas Aerospace workers demonstrated what you could do if you trust the workers to come up with ideas of what their skills can be used for and how they can be part of that transition. And although, although some of the ideas that the Lucas plan unleashed weren't actually undertaken by Lucas Aerospace itself. They were undertaken by others. So Mike Cooley was one of the key players in this plan, and he went on to work for the GLC, and he set up technology networks that created hundreds of designs and prototypes, including electric bicycles, small-scale wind turbines, energy conservation products, disability devices, all kinds of things. And they were really the forerunners to today's hacker spaces and fab labs, you know, basically people coming together to brainstorm ideas based on their shared experience and skills. There's another example from Spain, and you will know a million other examples, but Mondragon, a small town in the Basque region of Spain and the home of the world's largest and most advanced cooperative company. And you'll know the story, I'm sure, but founded in 1955 by a Catholic priest who wanted to address poverty and division by increasing skills and participation. The Mondragon Cooperative Corporation now consists of 260 cooperatives, employing over 75,000 people, they have their own bank, they have their own social welfare, universe, uh, social welfare agency, they even have their own university. I mean, it's just extraordinary. And I think the reason I'm giving these examples is that I just think we need to paint a picture of what the Green New Deal could really be. Make it, you know, that feel, people feel that they can touch it, they can smell it, they can sense it, they can have confidence in it. Because I think for as long as it remains something that sounds a little bit academic, then we won't bring people with us in the way that we need to do. Um, I wanted to say a few words about, about the bill. Here it is. We're getting short of time. I have very few words about the bill. Uh, I wanted to say, first of all, that we weren't allowed to call it the Green New Deal bill because the clerks in the House of Commons, in their wisdom, decided that Green New Deal is a slogan. So we had to call it the Decarbonisation and Economic Strategy Bill. But nonetheless, <laughs> it is a Green New Deal bill. Uh, and I simply wanted to say, you know, it's been really important to be working with Clive Lewis, who is from the Shadow Treasury team uh, on the Labour front bench. It's been a great uh, opportunity to pool our different experiences, the different things that we bring to this process. The bill has been laid. Uh, we are hoping to travel around the country and talk more about what's in it. Uh, but essentially, the crucial thing about it is that it does foresee a transition process, a 10-year economic and public investment strategy that prioritizes both decarbonization, but also, crucially, uh, 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 eradicating inequality. Uh, and so that is what we are planning to, uh, to, to, to work on. And just as Molly had the um, temerity to mention the B word once, I shall mention it once, it just feels to me that whatever happens over the next few days, we are going to need projects that are going to bring the country back together. We're going to need to be able to tackle those, those forces that, frankly, in many cases, actually led to the Brexit vote. Of course, some people voted Brexit because they hate the EU or have very good reasons to not like the EU, whatever. But a lot of people voted for Brexit because they wanted to give the establishment a bloody nose, and quite rightly so, because they were basically saying that the status quo in this country for far too many people is intolerable. And they were right, it is. And therefore, if we can look at how we can tailor this to be able to invest in precisely those communities who feel that they've got no voice anymore in our politics, then we might just have an opportunity of both bringing the country together and getting ourselves off that collision course with climate catastrophe. Thank you.